JS and go to Rust. He will, just like I said, he will be uh, the co-host for this meetup and he will be monitoring the, the matrix chat as well. So uh, we volunteered lately to uh, keep running the meetup, Scott and me, but we have a huge support from Brian, Jan Eric and Ryan Levick, who kind of are currently busy on other, other things. So we kind of volunteer to take uh, to keep running this meetup. And the Ross meetup is uh, basically a place for everyone to share. Uh, we don't expect necessarily an expert level from all angles. We we take we are ready to consume content because we also want to know uh, the struggles and these are the things that can help Ross uh, grow as a community. Also improve things that are lacking. Also, Rust has had a fulgurant, uh, a fulgurant uh, need in terms of how, how the, the language has grown into mainstream for in a short, in so much short amount of time. But we still have, feel like there are a lot of areas we need to improve. And this is kind of a space where we kind of share, have fun, share our knowledge and also get to detect what are the things we are lacking in the community and try to fix that. So it's really a community for everyone to come learn and, and grow together. And for we follow the Berlin Code of Conduct and which is accessible at berlincodeofconduct.org. If you notice anything inappropriate or things that you might not like, please report privately or directly to us. We will make sure to, to fix that and improve things so in uh, such that we can create a community that is enjoyable for everyone. And the uh, Ross Intel Meetup is available online here on this Zoom. And we also have breakout rooms. Uh, regarding the breakout rooms, uh, when you feel like you are alone on a breakout room, you can always uh, move out from that room. And then we as the admin, especially Jan Eric, will ask, make sure to assign you to another room where there are people, because sometimes uh, people might leave your big breakout room and you, you find yourself alone there. So there is always an option to come back to the main one, and then we can reassign you. And we also have matrix chats available where you will be able to post your questions. Uh, we have the live stream currently on YouTube. So you also can type your questions anytime in the chat here on Zoom or on the matrix chat. We'll make sure to forward your question to the speaker afterward. Uh, another word is like, we want you because this community is uh, by us and for us. So we are always looking for speakers on any level to, to make sure we keep running the, the meetup. And also just like the first goal I highlighted that we want to create a space for everyone to be comfortable with in the Ross community. So we are always looking for speakers. If you want to speak, even if it is your first time, we, we will support you, guide you through this process so you can give us your talk because we always have something to share and to learn from everyone. Uh, today, we will have uh, three talks. The first talk is by Ashley Williams and she will be talking about Ross Foundation. And the second talk will be from Paul Butler. She, he will be talking about building a multiplayer web assembly game with Upper. And then the last talk, we have introduction to CICD for Ross with GitLab, and that talk will be given by Mario Garcia. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I think they, um, it's been highlighted that if we run more than 100 attendees into the, uh, the Zoom, uh, some people will have to go directly onto the live stream because Zoom has this kind of restriction. So yes, and we also hope that will be the case because we want to break the record, why not? So without further ado, I think uh, I will let Ashley uh, kick off this meetup. All right, can everybody hear me? 
I forget that no one can unmute. So, um, hi, my name is Ashley Williams. I'm a member of the Rust core team and have been variously uh, a member or leader of many of the teams in the Rust governance structure. Uh, but I'm speaking to you today as the interim executive director of a fantastic new organization that you may have heard of called the Rust Foundation. Um, what I'd like to do in the talk today, and I only have 20 minutes, so it is going to be a wild ride. I always make way too many slides, uh, is I'd really like to talk to you about the philosophical kind of background behind the foundation, what's motivating it, and help you try to understand why we are so excited about it. Um, there's probably eight talks worth of content about how this organization is set up and maybe I can come back and talk about those. So if you have a particular question and I don't end up answering in in this talk, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, infamously, I am AG underscore dubs on Twitter. If you follow me, I'm sorry. Um, but also if you follow me on Twitter, some of these ideas might be uh, familiar. All right, so let's go. All right, so first off, if you are unaware, uh, the Rust Foundation has a website at foundation.rust-lang.org, and uh, you can see a ton of stuff here. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is the tagline that we've written here, which says, a new approach to sustaining and growing a large participatory open source ecosystem. And so if you haven't attended a talk of mine before, you know I like to kind of dig into really simple kind of tactical questions early on. So uh, I'm gonna ask the question, why does open source matter? Keep it simple, right? Why does open source matter at all? And I might even grow that just a little bit because of the kind of current zeitgeist in the open source ecosystem, which is what does software freedom mean? Now, there's a lot of different answers to this question, but kind of canonically, what we've seen is people tend towards tend to talk about licenses and they will talk often about these four essential freedoms of software, which were established by the GNU project, uh, which is stewarded by the Free Software Foundation, which you may or may not be aware of and is currently in the news. We're not gonna talk about that specific situation exactly, but what I do wanna talk about is these four essential freedoms and why to a certain extent, I think we're missing the forest for the trees when we talk about software freedom. So these four essential freedoms set aside the idea that you should be able to have freedom to run the program as you wish, to study how it works, to redistribute copies. If you've ever read a, uh, a software license, these are kind of the aspects that a license will talk about. But what I'd like to point out today and what I think is some of the motivation behind the Rust Foundation is that the really killer, awesome aspect of open source is not actually this type of freedom. It doesn't really have to do with licenses, but instead it's this idea of collaboration. And the reason I bring this up is because when I think about using open source, when I think about the work I do in open source, I'm overwhelmed by the idea that I don't feel free. If we were in person, this would be the moment where I'd ask how many open source maintainers are in the audience? And then I would say, keep your hand up if you're feeling, you know, okay, not completely underwater. Right, and we'd probably take a look over that landscape and what we'd see is a lot of folks who might be open source maintainers that are feeling really overwhelmed. I think the promise of open source and software freedom still exists today, but I think we haven't achieved it yet. And I think part of that is because of how we've focused on licensing when I think what we need to focus on is this element of participation and in particular what I like to call the freedom to collaborate. So this is my original pitch. And so we'll talk a little bit about what the freedom to collaborate means and what it means for organizing open source projects today. So when we kicked off the Rust Foundation, we had our very first board meeting on February 9th. And this was the third slide in my deck to the board. 
this is a composite image that I created of the GitHub avatars of all of the folks on the Rust teams in 2018 when I gave my core team keynote um, uh, at RustConf. And the reason I shared this slide is that with everything that the board of the Rust Foundation does, every decision we make, I want us to be asking the question, how does this help the maintainers of Rust? And this is the driving force behind the foundation. And this is an interesting thing, and a lot of people might not realize this, but the key word in that previous slide is the word maintainer. And somewhat artificially, I have created this distinction in my head, and I'm eager to evangelize it, which is the concept of a maintainer versus the concept of a contributor and how they operate inside a large open source ecosystem. So it's crushing me that I can't be like, do people think that these are synonyms and like see how many people raise their hand? Because oftentimes you hear people use this word maintainer and contributor uh, similarly. And yet what I hope to do by the end of this talk is to make them be actually a very clear distinction and that the health of both of these classes of participants in open source is critical to that project survival. All right, so as a basic definition, what I would say is a maintainer is a person that makes contributors to a project possible. So fundamentally, you could imagine this as a contributor is the type of person who makes a PR and a maintainer reviews and merges a PR. Now, at the very beginning of an open source project, this is usually the same person. In fact, an open source project usually starts with just one person and they put on this single hat of contributor and maintainer. But as that project grows, overwhelmingly, we find that people need to have slightly different hats and that the original person kind of holds on to this maintainer role, whereas there's a large influx of contributors that come in. So when we talk about Rust, now with Rust being so huge, I would say in general that Rust team members are part of this maintainer class. And then there's a huge set of folks who contribute to Rust underneath. So just to run a couple of numbers, Rust governance is really uniquely distributed and delegated, which is to say, we have a lot of people who are participating in Rust and they're also participating in a leadership role. So Rust has 10 top level teams 54 project groups, which could either be top level or within a team. And amongst the people who are members of those teams and project groups, we have 260 folks. Now that is not solely contributors. Those are people who are leading contributors. It's a large number. All right, and then as of October in 2020, when I last ran these numbers on GitHub, we had 5,503 all-time contributors, and that was averaging around 350 contributors per release and growing. Now to, to note, this is just for Rustlang slash Rust, which does not include all of the other projects that are in the Rust ecosystem, which is many. Even under the official umbrella of Rust, there's significantly more to Rust than just the compiler or the language. You can include Crates.io and Cargo, Rustdoc. There's several things. So this is contributors just to Rustling Rust. The number is actually significantly higher. All right, and then in addition, we've had 623 new people as of this year contribute to the github.com slash rustling github org. And we've had 1,467 new people uh, contribute to Erlo, which is our user uh, forums. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, you should definitely check those out. We have both internals and users um, to be able to discuss uh, things of Rust nature. So there's a lot of new people showing up and they are showing up in this contributor role. Um, all right, and then finally, these are some of my most favorite numbers, but Rust has 471 merged RFCs. If you're new to Rust, RFCs are documents that we create in a process to make large decisions in the Rust project. Um, all of the large decisions happen there, and it's a very transparent process. Um, for those 471 merged RFCs, we've had 
1,128 unique individuals participating in RFCs. That is an incredibly large number of people to be making these high level decisions in the Rust project. And I think it is a huge testament to what we've built that we've been able to include those people. But the fun thing to think about is Rust is just at this moment of this inflection curve of adoption. And while these big numbers are big, these big numbers are going to get bigger. And that's when I get a little nervous. <laughs> So uh, some of you may have joined because you saw me tweet out this image. Um, and this is an image that has kind of been stuck in my head for a very long time, probably the last five years or so. And it is what keeps me up at night and it is what motivates the work that I'm currently doing at the Rust Foundation. So first off, I wanna make it very clear that this is a sketch that I made about three hours ago, and it is not scientific, and it is almost certainly inaccurate. But because it is likely inaccurate and not scientific, what I want you to get the sense of from this sketch is the idea of thinking about how these constituencies grow and react to each other over time. Because I think understanding this system is the route to finding sustainability in an open source project. So if you have criticisms of this document, I am super excited for that. It is sketchy so that it starts a conversation. So with that, let's take a look at this in particular. So there's a project here. This kind of represents an open source project. The Y axis represents number of humans and the X axis is over time. So you can see if you look right at the beginning of time, clearly this is already inaccurate because every project starts with basically no users, no commenters, and probably one maintainer. So we're starting our timeline a little bit a little bit later on in the process. But looking at this, what we can see is we start with we have more people working on the project, maintaining the project, contributing to the project than we have using it. And also quite classically, we have more people commenting on it than people who are using it. And then we can take a look at how these grow over time. So as the project progresses, what we see is that we see a growth in contributors alongside the growth of users as well as the growth of commenters, whereas the maintainer level tends to stay around the same number. And if we take a look at some of these ratios, thinking about the number of maintainers who have to be helping those number of contributors, responding to those number of commenters, that ratio is starting to grow quite dramatically. As time moves on, I think we hit a critical spot where the number of users is actually surpassing the number of contributors and that you have a lot of folks who are able to use and comment on your software, but not able to contribute back. And what you should also note is on that maintainer line, that number is starting to slide down. And then finally, at the end of time, in this scenario, what we see is we have co both commenters and users growing exponentially, and we start to see a dip in maintainers and contributors are staying flat. Now I've drawn this in this way because this is how I've seen a lot of a lot of open source projects play out. And this starts to be around the time where you feel the velocity of the project slowing down. A lot of people talk about the hype cycle of projects where, oh, everyone's so excited at the beginning, but then eventually, you know, they kind of go to the next new thing. And people often blame, uh, you know, the people chasing those things for this reaction. But I think that's an inversion of the problem. Whereas, what happens is these projects tend to slow down because they haven't found a way to increase the number of contributors and maintainers to be able to support their growth. And so their growth, to a certain extent, stalls the project and then the project stalls out and we move on to something new. This is the future that I don't want. And what I'm trying to focus on is how can we change these lines in order to build a healthier and more exciting future for Rust. So 
we're talking about maintainers. What is this plight of maintainers? I think there's a lot about this role because we haven't given it a name that we don't pay attention to. And if we do, we'll be able to figure out some ways to help focus on it. So in particular, I would say maintainer work requires incredibly high context and very high consistency. You need to really have a sense of everything that's kind of going on inside of your project. And you need to be available at many, many different times to be able to field questions, to be able to respond to events. And so if you're hearing these aspects of high context and high consistency, you'll realize that as a volunteer, it's very difficult to meet those aspects, right? And what I'd want to call out is as we think about maintainership being something from a volunteer, <laughs> if you have the misfortune to succeed in open source, maintainership is going to become a full-time job. However, it's really rarely the case that we see that open source maintainers actually get compensated for their work the way a full-time job might. I think we're at a moment right now in open source where we're seeing a lot of interesting um, different attempts at solutions. Uh, the Rust Foundation is throwing its hat into that, but there's all sorts of ones like the Open Collective, there's GitHub sponsors, kind of the whole microfinance uh, area. Uh, we're taking a different path from that, but there's a lot of efforts right now that you would call under this open source uh, sustainability hat. Um, and it's because this idea of maintainership being a full time job is, is such a, a present thing at the moment. So uh, to kind of throw this home, I thought, hey, why don't I just search, search my Twitter for how many times I've talked about burnout? And this would be the moment where I look out on the room and say, how many people here are open source maintainers and feeling burnt out? How many people here just are maintaining any piece of software and feel burnt out? Um, and so we'd see all these hands. I know everyone doesn't have their video open. But I ran this search and I took a look at some of the things I said. And one of the things that I was struck by is that not only had I talked about burnout a lot, but I also had talked about it for a really long time. I don't know if you're seeing the timestamps on these, but I'm looking at this and I'm like, wow, I was tweeting about burnout five years ago. That's, that's a signal. And so one of the ones that I thought was particularly interesting is, is literally five years ago, I was like, huh, I wonder if, you know, these bubbles we see in startups, you know, has something to do with systems hitting this limit of maintainability. And I wasn't really fully in open source around this time, though, arguably, I was maybe never not in open source. But it was striking to me that this idea of maintenance was something that stuck with me and pointed me out in tech and felt like it was this source of burnout. And so thinking about this role of maintainer, its relationship to keeping software uh, you know, fresh and healthy, um, as well as its relationship to burnout seemed really interesting to me. As you can see, 2016, saying, I see a lot of startups burn out because building a thing requires five people, but maintaining and changing it over time takes exponentially more. And I don't think this is unique to startups. Uh, what is a large open source project except a less well-organized giant or like company? Um, I think that a lot of these things are the same. And we think about the cost it takes to build something, but then the cost to make that thing stay awesome over time, not just sustaining it, but keeping it thriving. Uh, it grows in people. And so coming up with ways to support those people is something that I'm deeply motivated by. So this idea of software maintenance is an incredibly old problem. Uh, how are we gonna fix it, right? So the more participatory a project is, the more maintenance work it's gonna take to enable it. The more empowering a project is, the more maintenance work it will take to enable it. And the higher quality of a contributor experience, the more maintenance work it will take to enable it. And so this underscores the fact that Rust is playing on hard mode. Not only is this an old problem that a lot of people have to face, but Rust 
Russ has set the bar extremely high. And I think that this is one of the reasons that we're in a best position to tackle it because we can feel these pains extremely carefully. And because our values are so associated with making that contributor experience high, we really are motivated to figure out how we can continue to enable that over time. So what do we do? You just talked about a whole bunch of problems. Everyone's like, yeah, open source, it has a sustainability problem. What do we do? All right, enter Rust Foundation. This is something that we're really zeroed in on trying to fix. So classic open source foundations generally focus on growing adoption, particularly in corporations. Um, and so what I would like to propose is like the Rust Foundation is actually not concerned about growing adoption whatsoever. In fact, I think we can assume adoption. We are seeing people pick up Rust in so many different places. Instead, I think our focus needs to be surviving adoption. And when I ran this by some of my folks on the board and on the core team, they're like, we don't wanna just survive. We wanna capture adoption. And so what does that mean? So we got this picture, right? So <laughs> um, the picture is very similar to the one that we had before, but it's particularly focused on the growth of corporate use. So again, our axes are the same. Y is number of people, X is time. And what we see here is the one up at the top is people with ideas about your thing, generally high and just grows even higher. And then we have corporate users, which starts very low and then starts growing exponentially. And then in the middle, we have maintainers. Now, this line is very interesting because you often see once you have this kind of hockey stick growth of corporate users, that your number of maintainers actually starts to decrease. And part of this is because corporate users go, oh my gosh, Rust is awesome. I wanna build the rest of my product's future on Rust. I need to hire the best Rust developers. Who are the best Rust developers? Oh my goodness, they're the people who wrote Rust. And so inevitably what happens is these corporations scoop up a bunch of the folks who are working on the open source project to work with the language and not on it. And we get this kind of brain drain. So my thought was, okay, what if we can leverage the desire for corporations to be able to hire these folks um, but instead of hiring them to work with it, hire them to continue to work on it, which is to say, take this maintainer curve that's dipping like this and help align it with that corporate use line. All right. So as you can see here, the goal that we're trying to do is to take this curve of maintainers and align it with the curve of users and if we're able to, to, to grow our set of maintainers and stabilize that, they're gonna be able to support more contributors, which will hopefully convert many of the commenters into contributors. So at this point, like, oh, I thought I had another slide. Well, anyways, so what we're trying I to propose here, yeah? I yeah, we, I think we are now over time, so yes, I'm sorry. All right, I can quickly speed it up, which yes, is yes, the final yes. point is being a maintainer should be a career opportunity, and we've been designing the Rust Foundation to help support that. So in particular, for our membership fees, we have what we call this team member discount, where for organizations that employ Rust team members, for 100% of their time, we're giving them a 15% discount on their fees, which can go up to a 45% total discount. So we are trying to incentivize organizations to hire folks full time to work on Rust in their capacity as a maintainer. And so this is all stuff about our board and we can talk about that. Obviously I've been doing all this crazy stuff with lines and you probably think this is wild, but if you hear anything, what I want you to hear is that I feel an optimism that I haven't felt in a long time about open source sustainability, and I want you all to feel it too, all right? This freedom to collaborate is something that Rust is really stewarding and I think is really, really incredible. Uh, Rust is, the only thing that Rust is, is the emergent product of the people who are building Rust. And so 
While people and collaboration are both expensive, they are the only thing worth investing in. And so investing in Rust and investing in the Rust Foundation is really about investing in its people. And with that, I will stop taking up all the time. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Yes, we usually kind of do a virtual round of applause. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so far, we haven't got uh, any questions on the chat. Uh, I don't know if uh, Scott, you were able to capture some questions. So we can do direct, but yes, we have really virtual uploads going all around. Thank you, Ashley, for this beautiful presentation. And yeah, no questions yet. Okay. So with that, I think we'll just move on to the next talk. That is building web assembly with Paul. Hi everyone, I'm Paul. I'm excited to talk to you today about building a multiplayer WebAssembly game in full stack Rust, uh, which is something I started playing around with at the beginning of the year um, and have since then been thinking a lot about sharing state in Rust across running instances of an application, um, even more generally than games. So the way that I've kind of structured this is I'll, I'll talk about um, that problem of sharing state between instances uh, regardless of whether they're games or not, and then show how I use that to actually implement a, a very simple game. To kind of start at the end, um, and this may be playing too fast to actually keep track of on Zoom, but you'll, you'll at least get the idea. Um, there's two instances of Firefox side by side here, running what will eventually be uh, the game that I build up um, through these slides, uh, just to kind of give you a, a high level view of what I'm actually trying to achieve here. The outline here is, um, as I mentioned, I'm going to start just sort of generally taking a step back, talking about this problem of sharing state. Um, and so the, the general problem is basically you have multiple instances of a Rust program. Um, in this case, it's going to be program running in WebAssembly, but we can think even more generally than that uh, about, you know, you, you just have some, some Rust code. It may be native. It may be uh, WebAssembly, you don't really, it's this architecture independent, um, but we wanna be sharing this state in real time. Um, the, there's use cases of this have actually kind of exploded in the last few years, kind of pre-COVID, but even especially during COVID where we have a lot of these use cases for um, things like Figma or multiplayer games uh, where we're doing things online that we used to do kind of standing around a whiteboard or, um, you know, editing code pairs side by side um, now is, is happening in the browser. So I think it's a great time to be uh, interested in state sharing. Um, so the initially when I started looking into this, I kind of thought of this naive approach, which is we have these data structures, you know, maybe we have a list uh, that's on all my, all my instances. Uh, what if we just kind of intercept every time we want to mutate that list, we want to push to the list or modify something in that list. We just kind of find a representation of those mutations, send those across the wire, um, do it, maintain order for all of these operations, and then kind of, uh, you know, maintain state that way across a number of instances. Um, so that actually works uh, in the sense that all, if you do it right, all of the machines will eventually have a consistent state. Um, but the problem is kind of more fundamental than that. Here's, here's a example to show what I mean. Um, this is a hypothetical packing list, a shared packing list uh, application. You can imagine something like Notion or, uh, or Google Keep where you have a, a multi-user checklist um, that's being synced in real time. Um, let's say at time zero, we have three items, items on the list at time, um, and at time zero, both Bob and Alice get a copy of the, that state. Uh, simultaneously, Alice adds a camera stand to the list and puts it at position index one because it's associated with the camera. Uh, 
at the very same time, Bob checks phone charger because he's packed that. Um, so we have these two operations that change the data structure. One is an insert and one is um, this modifying the checked item. And the server gets both of those. Alice's connection is a little bit faster. So that um, change comes in first. Um, and by the time Bob's change is applied, the item at index one, which he thinks is the phone charger, or it was the phone charger when he checked that item, um, is now the camera stand. So he's checked that he's um, packed the camera stand, even though he's packed the, the phone charger. Um, so this type of, of conflicts uh, kind of arise when you just naively take this data structure based approach. So my question was, what if we can um, represent the actual user intent instead of the mutation and then pass that intent along the wire? Um, so an example of what that would look like is in this case, what I've done is added um, IDs to each of these items. So these are unique identifiers generated uh, using the UUID crate um, when these are created. So in this case, he's checking the item and instead of passing the index, he's passing the ID. Similarly, Alice, when she adds the camera stand, um, adds it in reference to another item or its, its position is in reference to another item. And since it's a new item, she also includes a new ID. Um, and this gives enough information that the server can figure out uh, what the correct state is um, based on those mutations. So more generally, my question was, what if we have a data structure library that can actually represent these intents? So it, you know, it's not a silver bullet. You still need the application level code to kind of infer what the intent is based on the user's interaction. Um, so this is, you know, it's not magic you can just put on your data structure, but once you have the application level understanding of the data mutation, uh, what if there's sort of a general way we can represent these data structures, um, such as a list in the last example. And so I've been working on that and um, it's called Aper. Um, it's a, a Rust crate, it's in uh, crates.io now, but it's a very early kind of work in progress thing. So I wanted to kind of um, get out early and show it to the world and, and get some of your feedback and show what I'm working on. So um, that's what I'd like to do today. So there's kind of two main pieces to this crate or really a, multiple crates. So two main pieces to this project. Um, the first is kind of the core data structures and state library. Um, and this is this part is completely agnostic to the transit layer. Um, so you could use this for synchronizing state within the, on the same CPU just as easily as you could across the network. Um, then the second part is some client infrastructure, client server infrastructure um, that's specifically built around the case of synchronizing the state over WebSockets to instances running WebAssembly compiled uh, versions of your state machine. And the idea is that you can either use the APER included data structures like list, um, which are built as state machines or implement your own state machine. The state machine itself is very simple. It looks like this. I've removed a few type bounds, but this is basically um, the core implementation of what a state machine is. There's a transition type, which is just the encoding of the user intent associated with your data structure. And this apply method, which um, takes your, you know, your data structure takes the transition and applies that change in place. There's two conditions you need to satisfy if you do choose to implement your own state machine. The first is that the only method, the only public method that's allowed to modify state is apply. And that also means you can't expose um, your members to the public in a way that uh, they may mutate them. And the second is that the, the call to apply must be deterministic. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're running that apply multiple times. We're running that on every instance that is synchronizing state. So it needs to be, to ensure that those copies of the state are in sync, um, we need to make sure that the apply method does the same thing to each one. So with that out of the way, I can get to the actual implementation uh, of this game as a state machine. Um, the a few kind of preliminaries, I mean, this is, uh, should be pretty standard stuff to Rust programmers. I'm representing, if you remember the, the demo at the beginning, there were two colors 
brown and teal. So those are the player colors uh, I just represent with an enum. I have um, a board. Uh, so the, the grid that you see um, is basically just an array of arrays. Inside those arrays, each slot has an optional player color. So initially they'll start out as none, um, meaning that there's no disk in, in each of those um, rows and columns. The disk is kind of the, what I'm calling the player token. Um, and then as a player, as players take turns playing their disk, this board starts to get filled in. And I've just wrapped it in a board struct um, so that I can implement some behavior on it. But you could just as easily use a, a raw array of arrays here. Um, then kind of expanding what this looks like as a state machine. Um, one thing in the context of, of Aper's serving architecture is that uh, players or users, when they join, um, they are given a player ID, but there's no significance assigned to that at the time they join. So we kind of have to manage um, the state changes as users join the app. Um, so initially we have no users in sort of in the game. Um, we have this waiting player, none. When the first player joins, they get put into this waiting player slot, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but there's still we're still missing one player to actually start the game. The second player that joins um, is what causes the game to switch to the playing state. When, when it's in that state, there's no winner initially. Um, players will then drop tiles, uh, which is the, the way the game's played. You take turns dropping these tiles. Eventually, one of these drops will cause a player to win, hopefully, um, at which place they are put in the winner slot here. And then the reset transition becomes valid. And the reset transition just clears the board, swaps the next player, um, clears the winner, and that sort of state change. So the way we're representing this in code is there's a play state enum. Um, it has this waiting uh, type, I guess, or waiting, what do you call it, thing of an enum. enum um, option. And there's another option that is playing um, that has a little bit more state attached to it because when a game is in play, we need to know who's playing next, what's on the board, who's won the game, and something called a player map, which I'll show on the next slide. This is again wrapped in another state, um, kind of for er ergonomics reasons um, that I'll ignore for now. There's this player map, uh, which I mentioned on the last slide. This is kind of just storing, this is what tells the game state um, which of the connected users is, is which associated with which color. So this is what prevents uh, the brown player from playing for teal, for example. And this is, um, see player ID here is a kind of an opaque type that comes from the serving architecture of Aper. But basically what it, uh, what it is, is it's, it's a unique identifier for each connection to the state machine once it's being served. So if I open this in, you know, in two tabs, like I did in the initial version, um, each of those tabs has a unique player ID associated with it. So the applied, um, actually the implementation of this as a state machine looks something like this, where we have a transition type, which is one of those three transitions I mentioned, either join, drop, which is playing the disk or reset, which happens when the game has ended. Um, those are wrapped here in this transition event, which is a part, again, a part of the serving architecture um, or infrastructure that tells, uh, associates a, a player ID and time and a bit more metadata with each event. And then the apply here is just a branch uh, looking at what transition type we've received. In the join case, we first check whether there's a waiting player. So again, this is, you know, we have two states associated with waiting. One is when there's uh, no players yet, and one is when there's one player. Um, so in the case where there's no player, we simply put the first player the, or the player that joined into that slot. In the other case, we can actually start the game because it means this is the second join. We have two players. We construct that player map by pulling out of the waiting player. Um, we, we let the player teal player go first, refresh the board or empty the board, start with an initialized board. We have no winner. Um, and then we're ready to, to start playing the game. Um, with drop, it's a little bit more complicated. We first check if, um, we check on the game state. So we first check if the game has been won. 
If it has, we it's a no op. Um, APR doesn't support conflicts yet, but I think that would sort of raise a conflict once it says. Um, if the we also check if this player who's playing is actually next. So if the the computer that's connected or the machine that's connected for, you know, as the brown player can, uh, tries to go out of turn when it's teal's turn, it, it falls into this if clause and um, doesn't go through with it. But if those if neither of those two things are true, then we see if we can play in the next uh, available the next available row. So disks fall because of gravity. So we, this is kind of the implementation of gravity. We look for the the row um, that it would that the disk would fall into. Um, we put it there. We check if if that play has caused someone to win. Um, we only have to check for a winner that goes through the disk that was just played, because uh, otherwise we would have found it in a previous pass. And then we just swap so that the next player goes. Um, similarly, when we reset, we first check if the game has been won because we only allow the reset um, once it, once the game has been won. But if so, we uh, set the next state so that the losing player goes next. We reinitialize the board. Um, we just pass the, the player map as is, and we say that there's no winner. So, you know, I, I obviously skipped over some implementations of a few of those methods. I was trying to sort of speed run this, but um, I think, you know, at a high level, at least that gives you the idea of what the state machine implementation looks like. And from there, it's actually really easy to kind of synchronize that state machine across a client server. Um, the one extra step we have to do is wrap that in this uh, state program. So we implement state program. Um, that just tells the APR framework that the transition itself is wrapped in the transition event so that it this so that the type system allows it to populate that. Um, but once we have that state program, this is actually what the server looks like. It's three lines of code. Um, this is using the Actix server framework. And so if you want to, you can write your own Actix server and kind of use the pieces of this to get a bit more control. But as a dev server, you basically just initialize this server builder, pass it the state program and say dot serve and it runs a dev server on port 8080 um, and kind of just works. And that's serving web sockets. Then on the client, so remember the client is compiled to WebAssembly. I'm using a framework called U for that. Um, and so the, um, the way that I do that is you implement this game view, or sorry, this view um, trait of, uh, of the package APR U. And so in that case, I have this game view. Um, the only real important thing here is that the, it implements this view method, which takes a reference to the state as well as a context object, which has some other things like the callback you need to call. Um, and this renders, this returns uh, U HTML. So it can do that using U's HTML macro. Um, again, I've kind of hidden away some of the implementation of view inner here, but uh, basically everything under this is just regular U code. Um, it doesn't really have to interact with the APR state framework. And then the last bit that's important on the client is to call, uh, call this client builder. So uh, this wasm bind gen start um, decorator kind of tells it to enter with this. And client builder here is just a APRU um, uh, struct that will take that, it connects to the server, renders the initial state, things like that. Um, there's also a build script. I won't go too much into this, but um, this allows you to compile the client code every time you compile a server. Um, so with that, I wanna give a real quick demo uh, of what this looks like and what's going on the wire. Um, so the idea is here, there's two instances in the initial state. I'm gonna hit join on each. Um, you can actually see the messages that are going over the wire. In production, this is, it uses bin code um, to, to fairly concisely pack these messages as binary. But in this dev environment, I'm just outputting JSON. Um, so it's this player's turn, so I'm gonna play. And you can see we received a message from the server and it's just encoding that drop transition and it's just playing that drop transition when I do that, now it's my turn. Um, as you can see too, it's using the player ID of the 
client that I'm running to um, to actually change what it's how it how it displays the view itself. Um, so each view, each user can see a different view of the data, even though their client does have an identical copy of the state. I'll, I'll play it one more and you'll see that this is sent to the server. Um, this actually doesn't modify the estate internally until it's received uh, the state update from the server. And that's what allows it to keep doing these things in order. Although one of the next things I wanna implement is uh, an approach where it optimistically applies it locally and then ensures that the server um, sends the same state update expects and rolls back if it doesn't. Um, so that's, uh, that's my talk. Um, this is all online. Um, so Aper is at aper.dev. The GitHub organization is aper-dev. Um, this example that I showed is uh, right in the GitHub. You can just cargo run and it will actually compile both the client and the server, assuming that you have the right Wasm um, tools installed like BindGen. Um, but it's, it's again, pretty standard tool ecosystem um, or uses this, this ecosystems tools. Um, and these slides are also online on, on that website. Uh, thank you, I, I guess I have time for questions. All right, so again, a virtual club round of applause. Thank you, Paul, for this amazing talk. And so far, I think we have had one question uh, coming to your way. Uh, is Aper a CRDT library? If not, in which way is it different from CRDT? This is an amazing question. I uh, actually predicted this question, so I have an, a couple more slides on this. Um, so it is not a CRDT. Um, one of the big differences, the way I think of it is with a CRDT, you're dealing with a set of, of these transitions. Um, this is dealing with an ordered sequence of transitions. and the nice, the advantage of the set approach with CRDTs is you don't need a central server to manage that set. Peers can can kind of send peer to peer um, what those transitions are. There's also the downside though that that set will only ever grow over time. Um, with Aper, you kind of you you step into the stream um, and get a complete copy of the state, and then you just get um, versions of the stream from there. So. Um, this, you know, the big thing for me was this monotonic um, memory footprint growth or, or state size footprint growth with CRDTs. Um, what I found was looking in the wild is that um, a lot of people who you think might be using CRDTs are using CRDTs as inspiration, but um, actually aren't using CRDTs uh, themselves, um, especially if they have a central server that it just seems the cost uh, the cost that you pay with a CRDT doesn't uh, always pay off if you don't need that peer to peer aspect. So thanks, that's a great question. All right, so the second question is from Veselinov. I remember watching a Google developer talk on how to overwatch developers to do a network replication for their game. Is this library inspired by any particular way of replication? Um, I took, I definitely took, uh, I looked a lot at what Figma has done. Um, the Excalibra developers as well have been pretty open um, with how they kind of architected things. So there's some good resources out there now. Um, and I definitely did look at, um, at CRDT approaches. There's also a ton of great material on, on CRDT and operational transform as well. But um, games are really interesting. I, um, I'm not a game developer myself. So this is kind of the first time I've tried to do uh, a game. But when I looked into it, I did find things like, um, like towards the end, I mentioned the idea of kind of optimistically applying state and rolling it back. Um, that's definitely something that, um, that I've read about happening in game development, um, as is the idea of kind of sharing the state code uh, between the client and server, which I think is, is a really great idea, even if you're not using Aper. Like just one of the coolest things to me about WebAssembly is that you can write the same code and share it between the client and the server without restricting yourself to JavaScript and Node. Um, you, you know, you can use whatever language you want and, and Rust is a great choice for that. Um, so yeah, I think that, that sort of general approach too of sharing code, uh, state update code, client and server 
does come from the game development community. All right, one last question I'm going to send on your way is, this one is from Flaky. Does the WebAssembly render, render the canvas or uses you and the DOM? It uses you and the DOM. Um, I use SVG. I actually learned a lot of SVG while I was doing this. Um, I didn't think it would be capable of doing the, both the, some of the transitions I used and also drawing a rectangle with holes in it um, turns out to be really easy to do with SVG. I thought I would need to write some path commands or do something, but it turns out you can just subtract um, using masks, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. All right, thank you, Paul. Thank you. I think that's, we can call that a wrap. Thank you for this awesome talk. And Thanks. how our next and last talk for today will be from Mario Garcia and he will be talking about continuous integration on GitLab with Rust. Mario, on to you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Mario Garcia. I'm joining this event from Mexico. I've been an open source user and contributor for a little more than a decade. I started with Ross in 2016 and I got interested in web development with Ross. And that's what, uh, what I've been doing with the language uh, over the last uh, five years. And two years ago, I got interested in topics related with DevOps. And I started to, to try with some uh, CI CD tools. But uh, the one that I would like to talk about today is GitLab CI, the, the CI CD tool that GitLab uh, provided when you register an account on the platform. So, this will be a, an, an introduction. And I, I've been writing about this topic so you can find uh, some blog posts on my dev account. And right after this talk, there will be another blog post available that I wrote last weekend. I'm also a member of the GitLab Heroes program. You can find me on, on Twitter as MarioGND. So these are, these are the tools that I've tried. I, I started with TryCI and GitLab CI was the second one that I tried. Uh, GitLab CI, I, I started with, uh, with this tool uh, about two years ago. Um, GitHub Actions wasn't available yet uh, during that time. Uh, it was released, uh, well, the, the beta access was open later that, that year. And why I, sh I choose GitLab over the other tools that, that I listed there or other that are available out there. Well, these are, these are some of the reasons why. Well, GitLab CI is part of the, of the whole platform. I mean, when you register an account on gitlab.com, you will get access to GitLab CI and other features that you will find interesting but it's also part of the open source um, project of GitLab and it has Docker support. I will talk about, about that later today. And other features that I like about GitLab is that you have also GitLab pages. It has support for any static site generator. Um, I'm, I'm talking about that next week and another event. And, one of the, the tools that GitLab, GitLab pages has support for is MD book, but uh, this talk is not about that. It also has support for TLS certificates with Let's Encrypt and has integration with other tools and platforms. Uh, I've been trying some tools that you can use for security scanning or keeping your dependencies updated. But let's talk about CI CD for Rust. 
Well, something that, that we have to do after we create um, a repository for our project, these are three files that, that we must create on our repository. You can find an, an example in, in, in this URL. This is a, a project that I have configured for trying GitLab CI, but you have to add these three files that will contain the following um, lines. So this one that, that is the prop file will contain the instructions. Uh, this is for Heroku. I will talk about Heroku and Google App Engine, how you can use GitLab CI for deploying on any of those, those platforms, but you can also use GitLab CI for Amazon Web Services or any other platform like, like Netlify. But uh, this uh, little um, example here is for, for, for Heroku. This is the instruction that Heroku has to run so, so your application start when you deploy on that platform. You have to um, assign the value of the, the port that Heroku assigned to your application in this variable. And you have to specify the, the environment where, the, where your application will be running and the, the path for, for the binary that is created after you build your, your project. And we have uh, another one that is Rust config. We have to specify the version of Rust that we are using for building our project. And um, uh, sorry, um, Rocket Tomo that will have uh, basic configuration. And we have to specify here the URL. Uh, if we talk about Heroku, the URL that Heroku assigned to the application that we create on, on the platform the one that will, will uh, be used for deploying uh, our project. And the most important part here is what it is in the production section. We have to specify the, the URL. And these files are so important. We have to create those files so Heroku know what version of, of ROS we have to use and what, uh, will be the instruction for running the application. But these are, um, depending on the, on the platform that you, that you choose for deploying your application, you probably don't, don't need to create all of these files. But the one that must be, must be there always is rocket.toml. And if we talk about Google App Engine, we have to create a Docker file with the instruction for building our application. Something that is recommended is that you use um, multi-stage builds for building the, the Docker image that will be used for deploying on that platform. And the file app, uh, the demo file uh, that we have here, you can check an, an example in this repository. And the Docker file will look similar to this. Why using multi-stage build for creating this Docker image? The reason why is that when we run cargo build release, we get so many files in the target directory, but we only need the binary that uh, we have to execute for running our application. So we don't need the other files available there. And that's why we use multi-stage build for that. First, we compile our project. We, down, uh, we download the, the dependencies of our project and compile the project uh, in general. And we get the, the binary from, from that first stage and copy that binary to the, to the last stage that, were, that will contain also the, the other files that we have in the repository that are important for um, telling the, the platform how it has to, how the, the application has to be executed. And this is the content for the, the YAML file that we have here. This is for configuring Google App Engine. Well, 
talking about Heroku, there's a build, there's not an official build pack for for Rust, but there's a build pack that I've been using for for deploying some applications to Heroku. This is a a build pack developed by the community. You can check the repository here. Um, but if we if we want to deploy an, an app to Heroku, we have to register an account. If we if we don't have one, after that we have to create a new app. Heroku will assign a, a URL that we will use for telling telling uh, Rust when where the application will be available. We have to add the Rust build pack. Depending on the kind of application that you are building, this is optional. But if we are deploying a, an app built only with Rust, we have to specify the, the build pack that we are using. Then after that, we have to go to the dashboard and copy the API key from our account. This is so important as we require this information for telling GitLab, GitLab CI how to access um, our account on heroku.com. And for Google Engine, we have to um, spend a little more time for configuring uh, our application and configuring the, the, the platform for deploying our project. But what we have to do is first is create creating an, an account at cloud.google.com slash app engine. We have to create a new project I won't, exp I won't explain um, the whole process as this, um, as I already wrote uh, an article about that, that will be available right after this talk. And well, um, we have to create an application, select a region from that, select the, the programming language. ROS is not listed, so we have to, to choose other but Google App Engine has support for Rust and set the environment to Flex. Then we have to create an account. That account will be the one that GitLab CI will use for getting access to our Google App Engine account and deploying our application. We have to grant access to, to the service account that we created before for the project, we have to add the follow the, the roles that are listed here. And then we have to create a private key. This will generate a JSON file that will be down, downloaded after we create that, that key. We require this file for configuring GitLab CI. And after that, we have to enable the app engine admin API. And finally, we have to add the, these storage storage permissions, storage object creator and object builder to for the for the buckets that um, that are created the first time we uh, create an, an application for our project. Well, and talking about GitLab CI, the configuration will change depending on the platform we, we choose for deploying our application. We have to configure first uh, by adding the, the variables that are required for Heroku. We have to add the Heroku API key variable and paste the API key, the value of the API key that we copied before and then create the GitLab CI configuration file. And for Google App Engine, the, the steps will be the same, but we have to add two variables, one for the project ID. This is the ID of the project that we created before. And we have to add the, the content of the JSON file that we downloaded in the service account variable. And after that, we have to create the GitLab CI YAML file. For the first scenario, when we use Heroku for deploying our, our application, this is how the 
GitLab CI configuration file would look like. We have two stages here. We, we can add more stages depending on, on the needs of our project. We have here the build and deploy um, uh, stages. In the build stage, we uh, build our application and run the test that we uh, that we uh, wrote in 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 the in our in our code. And uh, we, we can change here this value to true if we uh, don't care about the, the test uh, failing. But if we don't want that the uh, following stage started, we, we have to, to leave the, the default value that is false. And finally, in the deploy stage, we have to specify the, the platform that we are using, the name of, of the app that we created for in, in Heroku, and the variable that we um, added before. After we, after we create this file, the, the pipelines uh, of our repository will start. So the first job will be executed. And for Google App Engine, um, well, um, we have to um, to configure here, um, specify the the information about the service account that we are using for accessing our our, our account on Google App Engine. We have to specify. Um, the information uh, needed for, for accessing our project. And something that happened when I was building um, the demo that is available in, in this repository is that the, the, build, the building process took so, so much time. So I have to, to, add, to set the, the time out to this, this value is in seconds. So the, the building process never stopped before, the, before passing the time that, that Google App Engine uh, configured by default. And then uh, specify the, the name of our project, the project ID for deploying our, our application. Well, before, before that, I want to, to show you um, let me go to my GitLab account. Just give me a second. Okay, um, this is a demo for Google App Engine. You can find here all the files that you require for configuring GitLab and especially configuring GitLab CI for the whole um, CI CD process. And if we go here to CI CD and pipelines, this is something that I like about GitLab CI that we can we can see the pilot running uh, and in real time we can we can see uh, what is happening uh, when when the jobs are running here i have only one job this is really helpful as there wasn't um, enough documentation about what roles I have to add for to to the service account I, I created for Google App Engine, but also uh, the the blog post that I check uh, didn't mention that we have to enable the App Engine Admin API. So the 
the log here shows you the, the errors that you can get when, when running your, your pipelines. And this has been really helpful for understanding how to configure uh, GitLab CI for deploying on platforms like Heroku or, or Google Lab Engine. The, the other one, the other um, project that I want to show you um, is this one. The, the URL is available in the slides. I will share the slides after, after the talk. And so we can, we can see here um, the pipelines, the ones that, that, uh, that failed uh, there uh, because I haven't, I didn't know how to configure some part of the, of GitLab CI, but uh, here you can see what is happening when you, when you run in the, the pipeline. Something that I didn't add it in the slides, but I have talked about before is, is that um, Heroku, while well, doesn't have an official build pack for, for ROS, but have a, a community one available and you have to create those three files that I mentioned before. But what happened if we decided to use another technology uh, within ROS for building a, a, a project? I mean, what if, if we want to build an app with both ROS and Python? Something that happened here when we decided to use Heroku is that- um, Sorry, Mario, I have- I think, yes, I think we just crossed the, the time. So yes, if you can okay. wrap it up and we can start taking questions. Thanks. Yeah, um, well, um, I, I will share, well, you can check the, the blog post that I already wrote about, about ROS and, and GitLab CI by going to my dev account. You can, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to ask, or you can send me uh, a message. Uh, on Twitter, uh, uh, you can find me as Mario GMD. Thank you so much. Right, thank you. So yes, so far we've got one question and it's from Simon. Do you have any recommendation to reduce compile time for ROS built in GitLab CI? Well, uh, something that I recently learned uh, about about that is um, how to use uh, multi-stage builds for bu for uh, building your your whole uh, project, so you don't have to copy all the files that are generated after the building process. What happens if we copy all the all the files? Uh, we, we can have, uh, if we talk about uh, Google App Engine, we will have an, a Docker image of about uh, one gigabyte of size. But if we only copy the, the binary, we can uh, reduce the size of the, of the Docker image by getting a, an image of about 100 megabytes. Um, what is so important also is to, to test your, your apps before, before deploying on any platform, the platform that you choose, this is so, so important. So we don't have to uh, take care of the errors on, on the production side, but before uh, taking the, the code that we write uh, to production. The next and probably the last question we will take now for this one is from Devin Richard. As someone new to ROS, is there anything I could use the GitLab CI CD for as I learn? Yeah, I, I was talking about uh, 
so an example one of some web uh, apps um, that i that i've been building but you can also use for for uh for a, for a project that 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 will run on on the on the terminal that you don't you don't require to to run uh, uh, to deploy to any platform you you can run your application inside uh, GitLab CI by running the, the the app after the building process so you can use uh, GitLab CI for testing the, the apps that you that you are building while you learn. All right, so thank you very much, Mario. I think